thriving students, a consultant working with the DC Office of the State Superintendent for Education. And I'm so excited today uh, to introduce this new course being brought to you by OSSI, uh, LGBTQ Back to Basics. It's a five part series. We're meeting today, tomorrow, and next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, all at 3.30 p.m. for an hour. And we're gonna focus on learning why we must and how we can support our LGBTQ plus students. Each session is gonna be recorded so that Aussie can edit and upload the, the sessions onto their learning management platform and make the sessions available to educators who aren't able to be here and join us live today. I want you to know that there are gonna be moments where we're gonna pause and give opportunities to answer questions that come in, push some questions out to you. And those moments are gonna be edited out. So what you see on the learning management platform will not include sort of our back and forth of conversation. So know that the conversations that we have here today are gonna to stay here uh, among us. I'm hopeful today and during every session that you will have questions. It's why we are coming together. We're gonna to push ourselves to learn and grow together. Uh, and so, I'm like I said, I'm gonna have some questions for you and hopefully you'll ask some questions yourself. Drop them into the chat as they come up. If you've got something where you're writing down your questions, just, just take a moment, just drop them into the, into the chat uh, and then, like I said, you're going to see a slide now and then at the top, it says, think about, and that's going to be an opportunity for me to push a question out to you and for us to start to, to look at some of the questions that are coming in. And now a little bit about me. So who is Deanna Bruce? Well, I'm a consultant and I've been working at, at the intersection of health and education equity for 25 plus years. I uh, frequently advise, coach, and train schools in DC and across the country on school-based health care, as well as COVID-19. A lot of you probably recognize my face from COVID. Uh, LGBTQ supports and transgender accommodations, bias reduction, sex education, et cetera, you name it. I've spent a decade as the director of health and wellness for DC public schools, where I developed and led our LGBTQ policies and programs there. But for most of the past four years, I've spent working directly with meeting the health and wellness needs of the DC public charter school community. Uh, also, you should know it's, that I'm a proud parent of a graduate of a DC public schools high school and another graduate of a DC public charter school. So yes, this work for me is personal as well as professional and it brings me so much joy to be here with you today. There are some agreements that I want us to make to each other. If we were in a room together, I would ask you all to give me a thumbs up on this. Uh, so I'm going to ask you all to virtually give me a thumbs up. Great. Thank you, Bobby. I see that. Uh, so there's some five. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. Yay, Courtney. So nice to see you. Yay, Angie. I love it. Uh, I want you all to be present. Uh, being present means that we are going to put our phones down. We're going to not pay attention to all those other uh, screens and windows and pop-up thingies on our computer, but we're going to try to be here for each other and for ourselves, right? It's after school. You all could be at the grocery store. Y'all could be picking up your kids. There are a lot of places you could be right now besides right here. Uh, so let's maximize the time that we have together. Let's make sure that we provide grace and space for each other and most importantly for ourselves. We come to this work in different places and so some of us are like, oh my goodness, I could do this training, move over Diana and everybody. Some other people might say, wow, I don't really think about this, but I do have this niece that just came out and I really have more questions than answers. Let's practice active listening. All of us as educators, we spend a lot of time learning how to practice active listening. And so this is an opportunity for us to really stay focused in what other people are saying so that we can learn as much as possible. Let's ensure full confidentiality. Some of us might recognize other people here uh, and let's know, let's make sure that when we, when we leave this space today, that we're taking the information with us and we're taking the learning with us, but we're not taking the, 
oh, and this person said this, or you wouldn't be, you would be surprised to know that this happened. So let's ensure confidentiality to each other so that we can, you know, learn as fully as possible together. And ask, I keep saying that. You're like, I thought this was a training on LGBTQ issues, not asking my questions. But actually, Deanna, I, you know, I, I understand that you really do want to know uh, what I have, um, what I want to ask. And because that's how we learn. Uh, and we're going to learn together that way. So thank you all for the thumbs up. I appreciate that. Now, I just told you to keep your phones away, but now I'm going to tell you to pull your phone out. Focus here on the QR code, and I want you to pull up that link that you're going to find. We're also going to drop that link into the chat in case uh, you're not QR code proficient. And uh, I want you to take to click on this link. I want you to use it on your phone and it should pull up a knowledge check for you. We're going to take a minute now uh, for everybody to complete that knowledge check. And I want to tell you why that knowledge check is so important. We will learn and grow better as uh, funders of this work for Asi, as presenters of this work for Diana, uh, if we can learn about more about you and your experience. So we're going to do a knowledge check at the beginning and then a session evaluation at the end. And together, we're gonna, that's going to give us a better picture of how you approach, how you came to this work and how you experienced this training. And also, we want to issue a certificate of completion for everyone at the end of each training. Uh, so every session that you complete, you will receive a certificate of completion in a few days from us only if you complete the knowledge check and the session evaluation. So please, 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 I'm going to stop talking and you're going to fill out the session, the knowledge check. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue, uh, but please, if you're still filling out the knowledge check, please go ahead and continue completing it because I, I really want you to complete the knowledge check and then complete the session evaluation so I can get you that certificate of completion. Uh, she says, repeating herself. So some learning objectives. What do I want uh, today? After today, I, these are four things that I want you all to be able to do. I want you all to be able to explain the definitions of LGBTQ plus and describe the gender unicorn. I want you to be able to summarize data demonstrating the need to welcome and include LGBTQ students in teaching practices in the classroom and in the school community. I want you to be able to identify some policies that support the rights of LGBTQ students and staff. And I want you to be able to implement model practices for welcoming and including LGBTQ students at school. And so the way we're going to do that first through the knowledge check, we're going to talk about why knowledge matters, what the data tell us, what rights students have, identify some best practices for school policy and student support, and then we'll complete our time together this hour with a session evaluation. Again, she says, make sure you get your questions answered, big or small, please ask them, put them in the chat come off mute and ask when we have those moments for pause. Like I said, you'll see that at the top of the screen, it'll say think about, and that's gonna be when we pause to lift up these kinds of questions or send them in a private message, that's also fine. Uh, we don't know what you want until to know until you tell us. So here's an example, think about at the top. Uh, so this is a moment where we're gonna pause and I'm gonna start by asking you some questions and then I'm gonna give you an opportunity to lift up some answers in the chat uh, or take yourself off mute and answer them, or just another way to participate is just to write them down or think about them. So I know lots of us like to participate in different ways in trainings, and so I'm gonna give you lots of options and opportunities to participate. So think about, did you have a teacher or school staff member who supported you when you were in school? How did they support you? And how did their support make you feel? Another question that might be easier for some people to answer, if you did not have such a teacher, because well, a lot of us didn't, 
What kind of support could have helped you? So go ahead and think about that. And think about what some answers might be. Feel free to drop them in the chat. Think about them to yourself. Write out your answer. Or take yourself off mute and share with the group. Hi, everyone. This is Anna. I'll share. I don't know if it's in line with the um, theme of our session today, but, um, you know, I'm an adult now, but I still have the most clear, vivid memories of my first grade teacher giving me this gold star to go put up by my name for doing a good job. You know, she, like she had a chart and everything. And it was a really small gesture on her part, but I felt acknowledged because I always worked really hard and appreciated. Um, and that's how it made me feel. Thank you, Anna. So it was some affirmation. Your teacher gave you some affirmation. Yes. All right, we've got another one. My favorite teacher actually supported my experience coming out at age nine and assured my parents that he would be a trusted space for me. I went to a magnet school in South Carolina from kindergarten to fifth grade through through high school, very small class sizes, about 20 per grade. It made all the difference to my educational journey. Yeah, I can connect with that. Right, every educator here, right? You know, you can name a student whose life you changed, whose, whose life, whose trajectory you shifted because of your support, right? So who supported you? I had a teacher named Mr. Gus. He was truly a gem. He always made sure I felt safe and he made sure my family felt included and supported through the different changes in my home life with my parents divorcing. All right, so as we think about these tangible ways that, um, that teachers that we had supported us, that can give us an example of how then we can extend that support to an LGBTQ student that we may have. You already probably are extending that kind of support to some students that you interact with. So, you know, this is an opportunity for us to keep thinking about ways in which we can extend support. So a college advisor and teacher who is now a friend who supported me through my whole journey coming out. I saw my favorite professor from college last week at a fundraiser and, uh, you know, and every time I see her, I continue to tell her like how she changed my life, how she sent me on this path, uh, this career path. She inspired me. She motivated me. And she always says, oh, Tiana, you just did that work yourself. But, you know, so it's sweet that she, you know, she's so humble, but, you know, those she really did sort of continue to push me. Uh, and I, it's it's great. Uh, and your advisor said the same, and I'm sure you would say the same to your students uh, as well. Okay, well, let's keep going. This is awesome. Uh, and for those of you who didn't have such a teacher, this is a, again an opportunity like, well, how can you fix that moving forward uh, to make sure that you are extending those kinds of supports to students? So we're gonna get onto the basics now. Uh, why language matters before we talk about all the definitions, the alphabet soup. Uh, why do we need to know terminology? Uh, well, for a few reasons. One, it's important to recognize the diversity and fluidity of sexual orientations and gender identities that we see in classrooms and at school. Uh, another reason is to show respect and recognition, right? We're all human beings along with our students and we all do better uh, and perform better and act better when we are shown respect and recognition. And so this is another opportunity for us to do that and why it's important for us to understand um, why language is important and why the use of appropriate terminology is important and to support my, my community, right? We, it's important to my community that I honor their names, their pronouns, the language, the terminology, all of that is important. Uh, for students, for parents and families, and for our peers. 
So now let's let's get to know these definitions. You've if you've been to any sort of LGBTQ training, you've seen this this type of slide before. These definitions all came from PFLAG, which is a national organization that helps uh, parents and friends of LGBTQ people sort of engage and learn and advocate on behalf of their family members and their friends. So I've divided these into sexual orientation and gender identity. So sexual orientation is um, it's a terminology of its own. It's sort of who are attracted to when I work with young people, I'll say like who you who you have a crush on, who you want to kiss, that kind of thing. Like our our emotional, romantic, and physical attractions to, towards people. That's our sexual orientation. And so when we talk about LGB, that's that. But those are all sexual orientations. The T, which is transgender, we're going to talk about in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about the LGB. So, uh, does anybody want to come off mute and tell me what what they understand the definition of lesbian is? And thank you, Suzanne, for dropping important links into the chat. Okay, so lesbian uh, is is a uh, referred to used to refer to a woman um, who is romantically, emotionally, sexually attracted to another woman. Uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has actually had a sexual experience. It's just really about their attraction and who they are attracted to romantically or emotionally or physically, uh, a woman who's attracted to another woman. Uh, and so that's the L of LGBTQ. Uh, the G is, uh, it's it's an umbrella term that's oftentimes used to describe people who are attracted to people of the same gender. Uh, and in practice, sometimes people use it to refer to like a gay man. So a man who's attracted to another man. Uh, and so that's the G part of the of the of the alphabet soup. B is bisexual, and another word for bisexual that well, another term that can be included in the bisexual um, area is uh, pansexual. And so, someone who is bisexual uh, is they have the potential to be attracted romantically, emotionally, or physically to people of more than one gender, uh, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way or the same degree, but it's just reflects some of the, a definition for someone who has the potential to be attracted to people of different genders, the same and different. Uh, and pansexual is a newer term that fits within that um, bisexual umbrella where people may identify that they are attracted to people, not necessarily based on gender, but on just who they are. Uh, and then sort of the opposite of, of all, well, not the opposite necessarily, but when we think about uh, so the H here, heterosexual, is not in LGBTQ because that is someone who refers, who thinks of themselves as only attracted to people of a different gender or sex. So they may identify themselves as straight. Uh, any of those terms new for folks? I'm going to keep going. So then we've got gender identity. So I talked about sexual orientation, who we're attracted to, and then we've got gender identity, and this doesn't have to do with attraction at all. This is just what we understand about ourselves. Gender identity, it lives in our brain. It is our basic understanding of who we are. And so the T on LGBT is for transgender. And that oftentimes can be used as trans, and it's great when I train educators. Usually, there's someone. Someone tells me, "Well, that that is um, that's Latin," <laughs> uh, and then they talk about being on the different side as. Uh, and so, if we were in person, I'm sure one of you would raise your hand and say, "You know, the transgender comes from Latin," um, and I would appreciate you for saying that. And uh, and so they their their understanding of their gender, what they understand themselves to be in their head, isn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily match the gender or sex that they were assigned at birth. We don't perform DNA tests for the most part on babies when they're born. It's a scan of their genitalia, and then we I you know somebody says it's a boy, it's a girl. Um, some people are intersex where their genitalia may be ambiguous, and but it's not through any sort of 
deep exploration that we are determining uh, the sex of someone. We're just looking and assigning a gender to them. And so some people will tell us that their gender that they understand themselves to be is different than the gender that they were given at birth. Uh, and so that is transgender. We also under know folks that, who may identify as non-binary or your students may identify as non-binary. And there was a recent study that sh from the Washington Post and the Kaiser Family Foundation that showed that about 70% of people who are transgender actually identify as non-binary. And so it's interesting because T is the word, uh, but yet more people are maybe non-binary. And so it's a it's a, a little of a inside baseball, like, oh, is T the umbrella term or is non-binary the, the umbrella term? That's not necessarily important. It's just important that you understand that some people, some of your students are going to identify differently than the gender they were assigned at birth, which means they're probably identifying differently than the gender that's on their enrollment form and in their student information system. Um, and then for folks who are not transgender and not non-binary, they may identify themselves as cisgender. So again, we're going back to the Latin as same, and that refers to someone whose gender identity, which is up in our head, is the same as the gender that they were assigned at birth, which was based on their genitalia. Uh, so it comes from Latin and the same side as. Questions here, I don't see any in the chat, but if there's something that seems confusing, please drop it into the chat and I'm gonna keep moving uh, for the sake of time. So what about the Q? Well, what is the Q? I don't know. Uh, it depends on who you ask, but in schools, I always say that the Q refers to questioning because as young people age, more and more of us know what our sexual orientation is. More and more of us know what our gender identity is or have a clear sense of things. Uh, but for a lot of young people, they, they, they're they still questioning. They're still trying to sort it out. And so questioning as the cue defines someone who's in the process of discovery and exploration about their sexual orientation or their gender identity, their gender expression, a combination thereof. So it's a little bit of an, um, another umbrella term for folks who are still trying to sort all this out for themselves. Uh, also, the Q can stand for queer, and that's sort of a, a reclamation of a derogatory term. So we've seen communities of marginalized people where they will take a word that was used to discriminate against them and they will reclaim it and use it as their own. And so queer is a term that LGBTQ people use to describe themselves or their community. Um, so it used to be negative and now it's being used as sort of a sense of pride and it's also seen as a word that can be inclusive. It's inclusive of people who are questioning, it's inclusive of people who are non-binary, it's inclusive of people who are lesbian. So it's this, this kind of a, um, an inclusive term and even as people may experience a more fluid identity about themselves, maybe their gender feels fluid or their sexual orientation feels fluid, they can find inclusion in the term queer. But what I always tell people when I train school staff, they're like, you mean I have to use the term queer? And I'll say, no, you don't. If you don't, don't, don't. You don't have to. Use questioning for the cue. Um, and so when we put all this together, we've got the gender unicorn um, and the gender unicorn is um, it's sort of a, it's, it was developed by the trans student educational resources group, which is a group of young transgender people. And they came up with this unicorn as a way to help illustrate what we're talking about. So I gave you a bunch of definitions and terms, and then this is kind of a visual representation. And what young transgender people will tell us is that it's not so much of a binary sort of spectrum, because a spectrum is still, for my math teachers out there, is still assuming that you're adding to one. Where What the gender unicorn is telling us is that 
when people talk about their gender identity and, they, and and share what they express, some people like they're saying that it's degrees. So you may have uh, degrees of, of femininity or masculinity or other, and that that is all fine for for you, and that that may be. It, it, but they don't actually have to sum to one. So you can have degrees of gender and degrees degrees of femininity and degrees of masculinity. And for some people, they may say, well, I'm just non-binary um, or even that I'm transgender or that I'm cisgender, you know, if, if, you know, depending on how they experience the degrees, the degree of their gender identity. And the same uh, is, you know, affects their gender expression. So when we didn't really talk about, when we talked about gender identity, we talked about transgender and non-binary and cisgender. But then when we think about gender expression, that not, doesn't necessarily live in our head, but gender expression is the way we perform or show up for our gender. Uh, it can, perhaps it's the way we comb our hair, design our, do our hair, perhaps it's the nail polish that we wear, perhaps it is some other way, the way we walk, the intonation of our voice, all of those are ways in which we show up and perform our gender. And so we can have a masculine gender, a feminine gender, something, you know, degrees of each and or, uh, perhaps there's a different kind of gender expression that we're, that we're showing up as. And so that is just sort of how we present and show up. We already talked about sex assigned at birth. I called it our gender assigned at birth. Uh, that is, again, when we're born and the medical providers who are around us sort of declare us and declare us as a gender. Uh, sometimes people are declaring our gender before we're born through an ultrasound, uh, and then maybe they're you know, even having gender reveal parties and, and other ways in which people are talking about our gender that's assigned at birth. And again, that's by examining our genitalia. And then those last two, we talk about physical attraction, emotional attraction. That is, again, our sexual orientation. And when you can go onto their website, the transstudent.org slash gender, that can give you this in multiple different languages. It also can give you it to you as a coloring page. Um, I recently, you know, I was working with a, a, a transgender teacher uh, recently, and they were, you know, they were, they, they had used this actually to even identify their own gender identity. Uh, and so I thought that was a really cute way for uh, someone who is transgender, who's trying to sort of like figure out exactly who they are um, as they were sharing it, that information with someone else who was important to them. Okay, and so what I want you to just be able to do, right, this was a learning objective, you've got this, you can, you can describe this stuff, and then you can also sort of identify the gender unicorn as another tool in talking about gender identity and gender expression. Some of you may want to, you know, take this training, take this training series, and then try to teach your peers at school. And so I'd encourage you, this is another resource that you have available to you. I'm going to shift now um, some definitions. If folks still have questions about the definitions, drop them in the chat. We'll talk about them um, in a moment. So when do you know? That's a big question, often a big pain point when I work with schools is, but isn't it, aren't children too young to even talk about gender with? Uh, well, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics tells us that children actually by age two have a, are pretty conscious about physical differences between sexes, um, between sort of the, the physical anatomy uh, when I think about uh, what someone's sex might be. Uh, that is a, by around two, they can say that. Around age three, children can label themselves by a gender. So they can assign a gender to themselves by around age three. Three. And around age four, children have a stable sense of their gender identity. And so when I talked about gender identity being that internal understanding about who we are, that can happen by around age four. Now, anyone who works with children knows that not everybody develops on the same path. Uh, so this is sort of around, right? This is approximately. 
And uh, I will tell you that the schools that I hear from the most these days are elementary schools. And when they call me and they're like, oh my gosh, we've got a kindergartner who is coming out as transgender. Um, I will say, well, that makes a whole lot of sense because by around age four, kids can have a stable sense of their gender identity. Now, from the work that I do with schools, I will tell you that, that I see some bubbling up points that happen sort of across the age groups that that elementary school is calling me because they have a student who's kindergarten, first grade, a, something like that, who's coming out and saying, hey, I'm not a boy, I'm actually a girl. Uh, also, I see it at, a, at in our middle school students. Our middle schools start calling me because as young people or even upper elementary, as young people start to go through puberty and their bodies start to change, again, that's another moment when a young person who may be transgender is saying, whoa, whoa, stop this. Um, this feels uncomfortable to me. I don't think this is correct. Uh, and so they may be telling us something more about themselves or learning something more about themselves then. And we continue to see that trickle where more and more young people will come out to us as transgender as they age through high school. Uh, going away to college is another big moment uh, where now young people may be, or even not even college, but just moving out of their home. So they're away from their family of origin. They're starting to sort of get their sea legs on who they are as a person, as a as an as an independent person, as a unique person, and they start figuring some things out about themselves. And then we continue to see people even as they age in, you know, into mid middle age or even older folks are coming out and saying, you know what, I've figured this out about the about myself. So these are just sort of approximations. And this is sort of a you know, this is the, the purpose of the slide is really to demonstrate for you that very young children are talking about um, gender and sorting out who they are. Okay, so now sexual orientation. Again, this is like who you're attracted to. When do you know your sexual orientation? Um, and from what we know, there's a lot of research about this. I pulled out some research from the Pew Research Center uh, that shows that as early as nine or 10, and we already heard um, that somebody was talking about coming out to their teacher when they were nine. Uh, and, and sharing their sexual orientation with a teacher when they were nine years old. And that makes sense to me because of what we see in the data and also what I hear from schools, that it's those upper elementary, that's when we start to see some people will know their sexual orientation. Now, the average age is around 11 or 12. So we're pushing into middle school. And for you, those of you with middle, you know, in middle schools, you probably will tell me, yes, that's exactly right, Deanna. That's exactly when we're seeing it. Um, and at this age, they may not develop, identify the feelings as sexual, right? So that's like adults. So we like to put adult feelings and adult intentions on children and that may not be at all where they are so even though they might know that they are attracted to somebody of the same gender it doesn't mean that it's sexual um, but they can still have strong feelings or preferences and know that about themselves and then again as people get older they continue to come out, they continue to figure this out about themselves. But it's important, again, to understand that some young people, even in elementary school, can know these things about themselves already. So when we field questions from our peers, when we field questions from our from our parents, um, we can let them know like this, this is this doesn't this is not um, irregular for someone. Uh, in elementary school to start telling us these things about ourselves. So here's an opportunity to think about. Again, no need to answer in the chat because this is a whole lot of questions, right? The four questions I'm pushing out to you. When did you know your gender? When did you know your sexual orientation? Did it shift over the years? Was it pretty settled by the first time you knew? If a student's gender identity or sexual orientation was different than most of the class, how could you create welcome and belonging for them? I'm just give you a second moment to think about that. 
And someone in the chat is sharing that they are raising their little ones at home with they, them pronouns until they tell me otherwise. And if you ask my 3.5 year old, are you a boy or a girl? They confidently say, I'm a big kid. Ha ha, big kid, I love that. Allowing them to decide for themselves. So I'm not gonna ask you to share those first three answers because those are very personal uh, to each of us. But if anybody wants to share the last question, what they could do, how could you create welcome and belonging if you've got sort of an only in your classroom where maybe a student's gender identity or sexual orientation is different than most of the class, how could you create welcoming, welcome and belonging for them? And feel free to drop it in the chat or take yourself off mute. So for me, um, I put more of like, um, in my classroom, I think it would be more about talking about identities first, like making space for identities to be shared so that students know the diff like the different identities that students may have. Um, I think that that'll be like the first step because I think that there isn't a lot of spaces in the schools or in classrooms where these conversations are having had are, are taking place. So just like first, just opening the floor um, and then just kind of asking the student what they feel they need to feel belonging in the class, belonging. Mm -hmm. I've seen some teachers do that, you know, oftentimes teachers will have little notes, you know, beginning right now, right? In the beginning of class, you're establishing procedures and 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 modeling, you know, how you want everyone to show up in your classroom. And and maybe you're asking, hey, let me know three things about you that I should know about you. Or, you know, or, and that may be an opportunity for a young person to share with you who may not be ready to share with the class. Um, so that may be one step to take. Um, I really like this idea of creating space. Um, what I heard was that you're creating space for students to share with each other. Um, and I also like here in the chat, like including visuals that support the diversity. You know, GLSEN is an organization, um, glsen.org, that has um, like safe, pace, safe space posters that you can print out um, on your own computer uh, and post on your, in your classroom. Um, we also, yeah, October is LGBTQ History Month, another opportunity for us to sort of include this in our curriculum. Um, so thank you so much. We're going to keep going now and talk about some data. Uh, so what does the data say? So in D.C., we ask 6th through 12th graders a series of questions about their risk behavior. Um, it's asked every two years and Aussie administers the test. It's called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and some of you have probably participated in that. Maybe you were a classroom teacher or an administrator and you were asked to um, give the survey to your students. Uh, and what we know from that, we get a lot of uh, demographic data from that information, and then we're able to match it to some behaviors and sort of make some connections. And the, the you know, the data people at Aussie and the data people at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, who who fund this test, the survey, they will you know be able to you know help really make some um, correlations for us. And so what we know is that uh, about 25% of our high school students in DC identify as um, LGBTQ. And we also know that our middle school students, that Q is, is, is bigger at the middle school level, but we know that a, about 25% of our, of our high school students are also identifying, of our, I'm sorry, about 25% of our middle school students are also identifying as LGBTQ. And then we also know that at the middle school level and the high school level, about 2% of our students identify as transgender. Anecdotally, what I know nationally is that we have more people who are transgender than redheaded. Uh, so if you're trying to put um, a number like 2% into perspective, um, you can try to visualize like, well, how many redheads do I know? That is, I probably know more people then who are transgender. Maybe they haven't come out to you. Maybe they don't know themselves quite yet, but um, that's to give you a, a sense of what that is. And what we know from analyzing the data are that the students, our LGBTQ students are more likely than our other students, than our heterosexual or cisgender students. They're more likely to experience sexual violence, 
physical violence, engage in binge drinking, using illegal substances, and missing school due to feeling unsafe. And that last one's so important. They miss school due to feeling unsafe. And we're all here because we want students to learn. And if they are so if they don't feel that school is safe for them, then that's a problem for all of us. And it makes it a lot harder for us to teach people who either aren't there or are distracted while they're sitting in your classroom. And I'm going to focus on suicidality next. So I just want to flag that for folks. I'm about to talk about suicide for the next two slides. I'm first going to look at our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and questioning students. So among our LGB students, so our gay, lesbian, or bisexual students, I've got these like red circles here. And then we've got our other and questioning students on the right. And then all the way on the left are our heterosexual or straight students. It is like three times the number comparing our straight students to our LGB and Q students when we're looking at the percentage of students who seriously, seriously considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months, percentage of students who made a plan for how to attempt suicide, percentage of students who actually attempted students attempted suicide, and then the percentage of students who had a suicide attempt that resulted in an injury, poisoning, or overdose that had to be treated by a doctor or nurse. And that last one is also important because that's sort of the, the intensity severity of the, of the attempt. Uh, and so I'm just going to give you a second to look at these data, but, you know, First of all, I think we should all be pretty darn upset at how many kids overall are experiencing suicidality. And this is from the 2021 survey. We know the pandemic's been hard on everybody. And even when we think about that, that, that we've all been through the pandemic, our kids who are LGBTQ are having an even worse experience and, are, and the suicidality is even worse for them. And in the next slide, we're going to look at transgender students. And I think that the all of these data are terrible. I look here, and this is the number. This all these numbers keep me up at night. But look at this: about almost fifty percent of our transgender students, our high school students in DC, have attempted suicide. And this is from the twenty nineteen data because we have these we had this data from our 2019 we the the 2019 YRBS that Aussie administered did a full analysis like this and so we have these kind of data that's a huge number of students uh, who actually have made an attempt uh, and we look at that compared to and also pretty huge number 13.5 percent of our students who are not transgender have made a suicide attempt one or more times in the past 12 months so we've got a suicidality issue in general and it is um almost hard to believe almost hard to uh for me to hard to even conceptualize that number uh so i'm going to pause and ask us to think about what stood out in the data for you and you can share it in the chat. You can actually, you know, take yourself off mute again, or just think about it yourself. Three ways to participate. Hi, this is, oh, sorry. This is Angie from Aussie. I just wanted to say that I've seen the data. I actually hate it. The numbers are just so intense. Um, and to think that these are K to 12 students um, with so much life in front of them, it's really tough to see every time I see it. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Well, I don't want you to lose hope. Um, when schools, we know that when schools implement inclusive practices and policies, all students experience less emotional distress less violence and harassment and less suicidal thoughts and behaviors so this really is like i like to focus on the data but then i really want to, us to focus on the power that we have as educators to implement inclusive policies and practices that will benefit everybody 
And what we know, and some more data, I'm going to keep throwing some better data at you, right? They say one bad thing, you got to say seven good things. So these here are some good things. Transgender teens that are able to use their chosen names at school, at home, at work, with friends, they have significant decreases in, in, de in depression, in um, suicidal ideation, and a 65% decrease in suicidal attempt, right? So that we've got half of our transgender kids that... Um, that are that have attempted suicide, but if we can allow them to use their chosen names wherever they go, we can reduce their suicidal attempts by 65%. So that's super encouraging to me. It means that we actually, um, if we can keep our eye on the prize, we have a path to go. So this is where you come in. So they're a vulnerable group. And you have the power to change this narrative. You can be affirming and welcoming and accepting, and you can create supportive environments that will significantly reduce severe mental health outcomes for students. And I throw this, this is a bunch of words that kind of go with the word with the numbers that I just showed you, because I want you to remember this, like, you know, like tattoo this to the inside of your eyelids. You have the power to make that change for students. Um, this is suicidal rates for without having someone who's a, who's an accepting adult. And this is for students who have at least one accepting adult. Uh, and that is sort of the adult that I want you to be. You can be a parent, you can be a teacher, you can be a coach, you can be an administrator, a counselor, but like let every student have at least access to at least one of you. Uh, and we can see sort of improved uh, results for our students. And one way that we, another word that we can call this kind of adult is a trusted adult. And that's someone who a student views is reliable and caring uh, for them and can be this reliable and caring source of support. We heard that come up earlier when I asked you about your teachers that you had in the past. Uh, trusted adults can make all the difference. We know that there's data every way you look at it, that the trusted adult, which is who I'm asking you to be, uh, can make the difference for our LGBTQ students. So think about again, are you a trusted adult? It's not judgment, right? I'm just asking you, are you a trusted adult? You don't have to answer that in, 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 the, in the chat or out loud. But then also, how would a student know that they can talk to you? And this you might know the answer to, and feel free to drop that in the chat. How would a student know that they can talk to you? You said explicitly tell them. <laughs> yeah. How would a student know? You tell them. That's what you would do. You would tell them, you can talk to me. That's what great. about also like um, standing up for them a bit? Like um, I had a situation the other day where there was a child who had this birthmark on her arm that had like hair growing out of it and stuff, and a child was pointing it out and talking about it, you know. And I stood up for her, saying like, "That's okay. Everyone's body is a little bit different, so maybe the same thing. Like showing that we can be trusted by being there for them. Um, so if another student says something, you know, just saying like the the things that would support them in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I understand um, that our LGBTQ students are looking for signs of safety. And so when you model the behavior, you, when you model standing up for, for students, uh, that that's really important. And I know from a lot of bullying literature that's out there that students don't always think that teachers are there to support them, but they'll stand up for them if they're bullied. And so if you if they see you standing up for kids, then that suggests to them that you can be uh, a trusted adult for them as well. All right, we're gonna switch into some policy stuff. I love policies and laws. It may not be what all of y'all love, but um, that's why I'm here to help you unpack it. Uh, so if you wanna talk more about data, session three next, Tuesday, we're going to spend a lot of time on the YRBS. And if you love this policy section that we're going to breeze through, I'm going to encourage you to come to session four, which is next Wednesday. We're going to talk about policy for the whole hour. So there are some federal laws and court cases that support students um, 
and staff actually uh the FERPA is a is a law that has rights for transgender students you you've got to keep the information private if there's something wrong in an educational record you've got to correct rectify it in a timely manner. So if a parent says, you know, wants to change their child's name and gender marker, that can be done and you can use FERPA um, as your authority for that. Title IX is a federal law that we oftentimes think about when we think about women's sports. Uh, and I love to, when I when I work with educators, I love working with the educators who are um, who were coming of age in the 60s because these these women were, you know, that the, the played sports, they were like the trailblazers, right? Title IX happened and their whole life changed. And so that's sort of what we think about when it comes to Title IX. But it's important to know that it also impacts um, students who are transgender or in students who may identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or questioning because Title IX prohibits sex-based discrimination and the federal government under, interprets that to include gender identity, sexual orientation and gender expression. So we have those protections in those two laws, as well as in the Supreme Court case a couple years ago that says we can't fire people based on their sexual orientation, gender identity or gender expression. And the federal government, again, interpreted that to be inclusive in, of Title IX and that that applied to schools as well. And then um, we work and live in the District of Columbia, uh, where we have lots of laws and policies that, again, protect the rights of our LGBTQ plus students and staff. So the D.C. Human Rights Act is D.C.'s non-discrimination law. Every state has a non-discrimination law, and D.C.'s is very inclusive. There are 26 I think there's 26 categories that we uh, have protection under. Um, and I think about 16 of them are affect are required by schools to also uh, protect people, uh, you know, the, according to our different identities. We've got all kinds of identities. We, you know, our sexual orientation, our gender identity, and our gender expression are just some of our identities. The DC Youth Bullying Prevention Act also prohibits bullying based on those same categories, and so that's something that we all have in place. And then we have the DC State Athletic Association policies that allow, uh, in particular, transgender students to to play on the sport that matches their their gender identity. And um, and then you'll see at the school level we've got specific non discrimination, bullying prevention, sexual harassment policies. Oftentimes those are required by OSI. Like a school's got to have those in place. Here's some model language. The schools adopt the model language, and then that's what they're working on to implement practices then that prevent non to prevent discrimination, prevent bullying, prevent harassment. And so what are our rights in a nutshell? In DC, we have a right to our sexual orientation, we have a right to our gender identity, and we have a right to our gender expression free from discrimination, bullying, and harassment. Come back next Wednesday. I'm going to tell you what discrimination means, what bullying means, what harassment means. Today, I'm going to assume that you kind of have a good sense of what that means, but we're going to break it down next week. And so I want you now to think about if, if you thought that your rights were violated at school, who could you talk to? So this is like, okay, we've got a lot of rights. What if we thought our rights were being violated? Talk to a counselor, right? A social worker, maybe a dean of students, maybe your classroom teacher, an administrator, a teacher. Great. Dean of students too. Right. Okay, great. We're on the same page. Awesome. I'll keep going then. You all know that. So what are some best practices? We're going to close with some best practices. Glisten, like I mentioned, uh, has found, I mentioned them earlier, so you can print out their safe space posters. You also um, can use can use a lot of their research. They've done a lot of research. They produce a school climate survey every couple of years. And through repeated uh, implementation of their school climate survey, they have found that these four Areas create a safer and more supportive space for LGBTQ students. And what we learned at the beginning is that when we implement these inclusive practices, they actually benefit 
all students. And so comprehensive anti-bullying and anti-discrimination policies in place, check schools must have those. Uh, teacher and school staff who are supportive of LGBTQ students, part of that is training and practicing and modeling and all the stuff we've been talking about. Three, having a gender and sexuality alliance on campus. That's a GSA. Some people know them as gay straight alliances. If you're if you were in school recently, you might have been a part of one. They students are now calling them gender and sexuality sexuality alliances. And we're going to talk about those more in session five, which is next Thursday. We're going to talk about the role of allyship and GSAs and in 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 schools. So just the presence, the presence of a GSA can improve the climate and then also having LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. And that is another uh, that's the 4th pillar of the building of uh, best practices for schools. And so here are some policies we're going to go over uh, in session four. These are some, you know, if you're having inclusive policies, you're going to want to think about names and pronouns, bathrooms and locker rooms, dress codes, gender based activities, clubs, privacy and bullying and harassment prevention. When you think about uh, preparing educators, you're going to think about professional development and resource sharing, points of contact to ask questions, clear policies that are easy for teachers to implement and follow. Um, and the clear policies, it's not like a 100 page book that you have to comb through in 10 point font, but you're actually translating that into something that's easy for educators that are super busy to just pick up and read and run with. When we think about inclusive spaces like GSAs, you know, we're thinking about, you know, GSAs that can create community, GSAs that can support advocacy. And then we also heard about posting visuals. And then when we think about an inclusive curriculum, we want opportunities for students to identify gender stereotyping uh, and gender limitations that are in popular culture. We want to teach students how to be an ally and support each other. And we even heard about how teachers can model that for our students. Um, and we're also looking for curriculum that can help us interrupt hostile attitudes and references towards others if you observe them, or that we can also practice that through um, learning about LGBTQ history in a cultural context that can give us an opportunity to talk about how we can disrupt that today uh, in our classrooms and in our school communities. These are some strategies for you, some, you know, how do you use inclusive text? How do you refer to your students as scholars instead of boys and girls? How do you avoid there? I see gender segregation um, happening in class. Sometimes they'll separate students in a in like when they talk about sex ed or during lunch or maybe even lining them up to go to lunch. So find, a, you know, try to avoid these sort of arbitrary gender segregation strategies uh, because they don't in, in they don't create an inclusive environment for students who are finding themselves sort of at the edge of those definitions you know, that we talked about. We want people to feel included and when they're being told to go here and there based on I don't know who's understanding of their gender, then that is that sort of disrupts inclusion. And so find other ways to line people up for lunch. And then we're going to close. Uh, we've got these DC menstrual health education standards, which are brand new. We're going to talk a lot about them in session five, as well as the new social studies standards and the new health and the health education standards. They're not new, but there are a lot of um, inclusive strategies that are in them. So all three of these are education standards that exist in DC that are LGBTQ inclusive. And so certainly these teachers can, should be using them to inform their curriculum and their lesson planning, but you don't have to be a health teacher or a social studies teacher to use the inclusive strategies. I'm gonna skip this because we are out of time, but what we know is that LGBTQ students are 25% of your students. They do better academically when their identities are supported. Um, DC schools must prevent discrimination, bullying, and harassment of our LGBTQ students. And you as educators, you have the power to improve the academic experience for our LGBTQ students. 
I'm going to open us up for just general questions while also making sure that you've registered for the other trainings. We've got one tomorrow at 330. And that session two will be focused on transgender students and non-binary students in particular. And then next Tuesday session will focus on the YRBS. Uh, next Wednesday session, we will focus on policies and next Thursday session will focus on inclusive curriculum and allyship and GSA. So we've, you've, today you've gotten just a little bit of a, of a wet your whistle on some of the exciting stuff we're gonna talk about the next four sessions. Here's the session evaluation. I already said it at the beginning. In order for me to send you a certificate of completion to, for today's session, you needed to have completed the beginning knowledge check as well as this end of course session of uh, session evaluation. So use your phone again to drop, to pull up the, the link or to use the link that's in the chat, complete this evaluation. I'm happy to stick around for a couple of minutes to answer any questions that came up for you that we weren't able to get to because you were so busy being present. And I wanna thank you all for an awesome experience. Thank you so much for all the questions that you dropped into the chat, for lifting up uh, experiences out loud, for dropping your experiences into the chat, and for all of y'all who participated by thinking and writing things down for yourself. I see you and I appreciate you as well. And I look forward to seeing as many of you tomorrow as possible. And we're going to keep this open for a few minutes because you may need to access this link again.